Hello and welcome to UCL's Centre for Artificial Intelligence 15-Minute Meet series, exploring all things AI. I'm uh, delighted to say I'm joined today by Professor Mark Dysonroth, who is Deputy Director of UCL's Centre for Artificial Intelligence. Thanks very much for joining us, Mark. Hi, Mark. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Um, how are you finding the lockdown situation we find ourselves in? And um, out of interest, what, what challenges and opportunities do you think this has presented to AI researchers? So, I mean, uh, lockdown is very challenging for lots of people. I mean, especially people who have like care responsibilities and also like people live like very, like very cramped spaces. I mean, given that I'm actually very lucky, um, we have a two bedroom flat here. We have a small balcony where we can go outside and actually my job is also in a way that I can relatively easily work from home. But, you know, after nine weeks at home, I'm really <laughs> looking forward of like kind of like getting back to the office again at some point, which is maybe a bit strange. But there have been some opportunities. So actually last week or until yesterday, I attended a virtual conference. So virtual conferences are something that you know, we've been like talking about for like a couple of years, many years actually, mm -hmm. like as an alternative way to get other people on board who normally can't make it to conferences. And so the, the pandemic now forces us to actually implement this relatively quickly. And I have to say it was a really, really good experience and I hope this is going to continue. But similarly also like for teaching, right? So we, we already moved bits and pieces of our teaching online on very short notice. Um, again, there have been debates about like what to do with online teaching. So now universities are actually forced uh, to explore this much more carefully. Yeah, it does seem like things are, 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 are developing and changing in the, in the current climate. It's very interesting. Um, one of the things we're exploring in this series is the academic career path that um, various AI academics have taken. Maybe you could give us a bit of background on your, on your own academic career. Sure. So I did a um, computer science undergraduate degree in, in Germany at the University of Karlsruhe. Then I did a PhD in machine learning where I spent uh, parts of my time at Max Planck in Tübingen in Germany and parts at the University of Cambridge uh, in, in the UK. Then I did a um, two years postdoc in Seattle at the University of Washington and then another year and a half postdoc in uh, Darmstadt in Germany. Then I became a research fellow at Imperial and then a faculty member at Imperial from 2015 onwards before joining UCL in October 2019. Thank you. That was, that was very uh, <laughs> concise and useful. Thanks, Mark. And so you're now um, at UCL working within the UCL Computer Science Department. What was it like being affiliated with UCL's AI Centre? So the AI Center is a, is a very interesting construct and it's really nice being part of this. It's a super friendly atmosphere. It's also an open and collaborative environment. And so what I really like also is that it's not um, a, a virtual environment. It's like a physical space that clusters people that work on AI so we can exploit the synergies that come with this kind of like co-location. The space itself is also really great and the people are the people who work at the AI Centre are super friendly as well. So it's really great working in this place. Thanks Mark. And perhaps you could give us an idea of what exactly you're working on at the moment. So I'm generally interested in something we call data efficient machine learning. So this means learning or extracting information from relatively small data sets you know in some situations it's not really possible to collect huge data sets so maybe in healthcare maybe in climate science in robotics or many practical applications it's either too time consuming or too expensive or simply impossible to collect huge quantities of data so we're looking at multiple ways to address this uh, challenge of data efficient machine learning so we're looking at um, probabilistic modeling as a way to quantify uncertainty or express uncertainty. We're looking at um, meta-learning, which is a general framework for transferring knowledge from things that we have known or that we already know to things that we have not observed yet. But uh, so across different tasks, but these tasks are related to each other. 
uh, we look at um, efficient optimization techniques that allow us to effectively do experimental design. So choose which experiment to run next in order to minimize the number of experiments overall. So Mark, currently you hold the position of DeepMind Chair in Artificial Intelligence at UCL. And maybe you could a little bit, uh, elaborate a little bit more about what that constitutes and um, what you do as part of that position. So one of the key aspects of this is that uh, I'm there to enhance UCL's capabilities and world-class reputation in AI. That was kind of like the main objective of creating this position. Um, but I think at least equally important is uh, to train the next generation of AI researchers and practitioners, and also to empower, empower others to exploit their full potential. I think these are really the critical aspects of, of this role. In terms of research, my research centers at the foundations of AI, but also contributes to addressing global challenges that we face. And Mark, one of the projects that you've been working on a lot recently has been the Mathematics for Machine Learning book, which I believe was published about a, a month or so ago. And um, perhaps you could tell us about what the objectives for that project are. That's right. So the book was published about a month, exactly a month ago, actually. And so we, we wrote the book to, to bridge the gap between what you know from high school and what you need in terms of mathematical background to read an actual machine learning book. So we used, when we, or when we teach machine learning courses, we always had to refer back to appendices of other books. You know, read appendix B from Chris Bishop's book, read appendix A from the following book, and so on and so forth. And so it's, but it's also not satisfactory because you don't get like the, the necessary background in terms of like linear algebra or vector calculus or optimization from these appendices. So at some point we sat down and we really wanted to write a short book originally aimed for 150 pages, um, <laughs> that kind of like bridges, bridges the gap at really between high school and between the ability to read uh, a machine learning book, like for example, David Barber's book. Um, and so we really start with undergraduate material in terms of for, for computer scientists and engineers, so linear algebra, vector calculus, and so on and so forth. And then in the second part of the book, we look at simple machine learning algorithms um, where we then really drill down and explain everything uh, from more or less first principles, referring back to part one where we did all these mathematical principles. So the, say, the target audience for this book are people, you know, undergraduate students in computer science, for example, but also people who want to get back or into machine learning so, or data science but don't have the necessary background so this is kind of like the idea it's really more like a, a gap filler between things that already exist and talking about academic writing mark what academics have have most um inspired you on your career journey are there, are there any particular academics who have really contributed to your career development Oh, that's a good question. So actually there were lots of people who have, uh, I have been in touch with or in contact with who shaped bits and pieces of me. So my, my PhD supervisor really had a huge influence on me uh, in terms of like thinking about, um, not only about research, but also about uh, people. Other people had also lots of influence on me. So I had a postdoc supervisor back in Germany who kind of like, uh, mentored me for, for many, many years, and I learned a lot from him as well. So there are lots of people who, who do shape, uh, I think everyone just like contributes to, to individuals or individual personalities. And so, you know, absorbing bits and pieces from people that you just meet every day, or you know, maybe not every day, but you know, multiple times um, throughout your life, and you see what works and you see what doesn't work and then you kind of like put your things together and, and become who you are but you are never you never stop learning you never stop absorbing information and you try to kind of like be as good as possible but say so my phd supervisor and my my um, long-term mentor these ones are the people who really contributed quite a lot so Mark, in 2018, you spent four months at the African Institute for Mathematical Sciences in Rwanda. 
where you taught a course on foundations of machine learning as part of the African Masters in Machine Intelligence. Um, maybe you could tell us a bit more about this experience. So this was part of a sabbatical that I had in 2018. And I was actually very, I was already in touch with Ames. So Ames is the African Institute for Mathematical Sciences and they have uh, multiple campuses across Africa. So I already supervised some MSc students from Senegal um, before. And then I heard about a new degree in machine learning that is to be set up in Rwanda. So I got in touch with, uh, with the corresponding people in Rwanda and supported their uh, first round of this degree. It's called the African Masters in Machine Intelligence. So what I found there is that it's, um, you know, the excitement of the students is unbelievable. So compared to what I have experienced before in Europe or in the US or in, uh, in Japan, the excitement is just like a, at a completely different level. And Ames also takes care of the students. So every student has a full scholarship. That means uh, transportation, food, accommodation, and a stipend for every single student. The students have very, very high quality. So the, I think the acceptance rate in the first year was about 7%. Um, and it works in a, in a way that, um, you know, normally external, uh, external teachers come in for about three weeks and teach one block course um, on one specific topic. And then normally the only, the only teacher around. So you have a very close teacher student relationship over this period. So I was there for a bit longer. I was there for about four months and I taught a relatively long block course. So it involves like engagement that pretty much every day. And I had about 260 contact hours during that time. So that was really interesting. And, and Ames also provides this really full-time learning environment. Um, but also, so besides Ames, there's a lot of interesting stuff going on in, in Rwanda. So there is also CMU Africa. So this is a CMU campus in Kigali. So they host, for example, AI Saturday. So seminars and tutorials, labs every Saturday. There's space for innovators and startups. There's a lot of stuff going on in Rwanda. If you look at the country, it's also interesting. And so we know Rwanda mostly probably from the genocide in the 90s. Um, but, you know, that is no longer the Rwanda that, that is today. So people are super friendly, super helpful. It's a very clean, very safe country. So it's much safer than London and definitely much cleaner than London. Yeah. Um, and so I think mo most, one of the most important things in Rwanda is community and togetherness. So people really work together. Every month there is um, a, a community building effort where everyone in the country just works for like three or four hours on a community project like you know fixing roads building a bridge including the president so there's a lot of interesting stuff going on and the country is very forward looking uh, especially if you think it's one of the poorest countries in terms of gdp so the things that are really high on the uh, political agenda are gender equality quantum technology robotics autonomous driving uh, climate change. So these are things that the government is actively thinking about. Fantastic. And a lot of people are very excited about applications of AI um, in, in terms of changing the future. I wonder what it is about AI that interests you most as we move towards the future. Is there, is there any particular aspect of AI that uh, encaptures your imagination the most? That's a good question, actually. So um, I think one of the most important things where AI can contribute something is in um, climate and environment. So I'm quite excited about this um, where, because there are lots of challenges in uh, climate science and environmental modeling where AI or machine learning can contribute. And so we have a new academic partnership with the Met Office to kind of like, again, use synergies at UCL and the Met Office to drive this forward. But there are definitely also other application areas where AI can play a very important role and that is also like personalized education. Um, but you know when we talk about AI we normally think about you know super intelligent systems that are like human-like uh, beings and we are quite far from that still because 
we're still in the early days of these intelligent systems. And one of the key things that is missing is like semantics. So interpreting what is going on and putting things together. So cross-disciplinary and uh, cross-task learning and it intelligent reasoning. So these are the big challenges that we face on the way towards more intelligent systems. Mark, it's been fascinating to get a, an insight into your, your role and work at UCL. Sounds like there's a lot going on in the AI um, Center for Artificial Intelligence. Um, thanks very much for taking the time to speak to us today and um, look forward to talking to you again. It was a pleasure. Thanks for having me, Mark.